As protests in Hong Kong in Hong Kong continue, researchers from the National University of Singapore said the city has to tackle issues like income inequality to quell the growing discontent among its residents. They also cautioned that prolonged protests will lead to significant long-term deterioration of Hong Kong. Now, the team looked into income inequality in Hong Kong, analyzing up to 36 years of private housing prices and wages. Income inequality measured by the Gini coefficient has been increasing in Hong Kong, caused by factors like a rise in property and consumer prices, as well as unemployment. But what reduces inequality is the growth in GDP and having a large population with minimum tertiary education. The study emphasized that the short-term priority is to uphold law and order and to restore stability. But the long-term solution lies in addressing the root causes of income inequality, housing prices and the cost of living. Protesters will continue to emerge in the future if these basic challenges are not addressed. Researchers said financial assistance for the poor in areas like public housing, healthcare, and education could provide short-term relief. And looking ahead, a stronger emphasis on upward social mobility could make a difference by building the local workforce through education and skill upgrading. Now, for more on this report, Associate Professor Tan Eki Gyap, co-director at the Asia Competitiveness Institute, joins us in studio. Uh, Professor, first question is really, where does the buck stop with this? Because all these issues of, of high cost of housing, low wage growth, these all come back to the leaders of Hong Kong. Yes, so this is a longer term solution you have to look for. But until the immediate short term problem you, are, you can tackle with, for example, law and order, there's no way to even have a discussion, to even start uh, thinking for the long term solutions. Mm. And I think uh, the worst is yet to be, mm. believe me. All right, so uh, Professor Tan, let's talk a little bit about that housing crisis because this is an issue that has been going on for a very long time in Hong Kong. Uh, it would have required policies, good policies, in order to address. And we remember Tung Chi Hua many years ago attempted to put uh, something in place to address this. Uh, the, the failure of his, uh, you know, the, what he proposed at that time, would you say those contributed to the roots of what we're seeing today? I mean, in order to have effective government, you need to have effective policies too. Well, I think they know the policy, but they have successful, ineffective governments. Even the the most recent chief executive uh, Lam, uh, she wants to reclaim the sea to build public housing, but non-government organization protested. Now in Singapore, as what we have done, we would have acquired land, but politically, and in Hong Kong, there's no determination to do that because the land in Hong Kong are owned by big property tycoons. Mm. And they are far too expensive to build public housing unless you acquire them. So where is the determination? They know the policy, but they have no determination to push through it. And you mentioned there that the tycoons hold the property in their hands. Yes. Is that in turn the problem then? Well, it's an internal issue. In Singapore, we dealt with that quite nicely at the early stage of nation building. And subsequently, we do acquire land based on market price. Mm. Uh, so. Effective government is important. In fact, you look at the recent survey, official survey by the Hong Kong government, they say 58% are troubled by the property prices. 48% are troubled by economic issues. And they say income disparity, lack of upward social mobilities are important factors. So in our study, evidence-based study, our economic model suggested that the proportion of people in tertiary education is important. The bigger the proportion, the lower the income disparity. Mm. The wages between the middle class, the professional, and the working class is diverting. And the property prices of certain room type, they're getting more expensive. So the issue is very clear, but can you do it? Now, the worst, worst thing that has happened, I think this is the lesson that all countries uh, developing countries especially got to learn. You cannot wait for this unhappiness mm. to balloon into such a big, big mess of hundreds of thousands of people and there's no way you can deal with it. And so you have to knit it at the butt 
at the very early stage of the problems. And this, the writing was on the wall then, uh, as you're describing it, with the inequality, with housing going up. Well, that's what the chief executive said. But what we have done, after we did the econometric estimation, now we can tell them if the property price up by how many percent, how your income disparity will be worsened by how much. Mm. Uh, they can use that as a policy framework. Or uh, if, if your number of tertiary educations, the number of people in polytechnic universities are not increasing because also competition from mainland Chinese, mainlanders also come to, to Hong Kong for education. Mm. So they feel worse off because you don't have paper qualification. It's difficult for you to have high salary. So you are stuck below. The economy underclass is expanding. So you feel there's a competition for resources at yes. the very ground level? Not just for education, mm. competing for resources for healthcare services, education, and, and our cost of living index, which we track for 105 cities. Hong mm. Kong's cost of living was moving from 63rd position to 51, from 2011 to 2017. And food prices, transportation costs, education, healthcare. You can't have a city running like that when mm. income disparity, the rich are getting richer and the poor get stuck. Yeah, well, speaking of the rich, uh, we do have some words uh, from them. In fact, tycoons and top executives from Southeast Asia are watching developments in Hong Kong and in growing consternation, it seems. And no less than uh, Danin uh, Tanin Jirad uh, of the CP Group, Thailand's richest man, he's taken out full-page ads in several Hong Kong newspapers calling for peace. His empire includes a large stake in Ping An, the largest insurer in China listed in Hong Kong. The CP Group's uh, CP uh, Pokpan Investment Holding Company also trades in the city. Also, the former British colony has long been a financial centre with its own rule of law. It has drawn entrepreneurs thronging to where capital courses like water to where it is needed unbeset by capital controls. Now that flow, well, it has been threatened. Protesters have targeted ATMs, and on August the 5th, over 200 bank branches closed early because of the widespread protests. Now that day, Singapore's OCBC Bank, which acquired a Wing Hung a Bank, fell 1.2%, while DBS, which bought ANZ's Hong Kong Bank retail and wealth business, fell 3.7%. Malaysia's public bank, Hong Kong, a major lender in the territory, saw its holding company share price fall over 10% since the 1st of July. The long longer-term concern, say analysts, is that if borrowers start defaulting on their loans, if Hong Kong's economy perhaps takes a turn for the worse. Indonesian companies are not spared either. The Lipo Group, uh, Lipo Group, with a holding company listed in Hong Kong, owns Lipo Center in the heart of Central uh, and has wide-ranging businesses, including property, food and finance. Its stocks have fallen close to 18% from the start of last month to late this month. With all the unrest, uh, some more uh, bread and butter businesses from Southeast Asia like Jollibee have limited exposure, though, with less than 10 outlets there. But if the economy turns south, others like Delhi France Hong Kong, under the Lipo Group subsidiary, may find fewer can afford their buttered croissants each morning. Uh, Professor Tan, it almost feels a little bit rich to say that you know, now the, you know, the big businesses and the elites are, are raising their concerns and, and calling for peace when it's, it's the little man's frustrations uh, yeah. that are the result that you know, are sort of the end result of what has been happening over decades. Well, these big businesses, they can't do much now because those running on the street, they are out of control. They, you have to tackle the root cause. How are these massive protests? Are they funded? Is there any foreign element in it? If you don't go <coughs> to the source, they will continue to go even worse because mm -hmm. these are young, bleak future, non-stakeholders. Unlike in Singapore, we try to make as many people who are stakeholders. You own a HDB, the price appreciate over time. Mm. You get a good education and Im immediately upon graduation, you get a job. Now for these people, 12 years old get arrested. And I heard on 2nd of September, 90% agree with the class stoppage and 50% will participate. And now they want to move it to a younger, seven years old, want to be taking part in this this uh, uh, unrest. Can you believe that? So it is not the big businesses who urge them to become, restore law and order. It's just have gone out of hand. Mm. Something serious must be done to restore law and order, to prevent this 
massive unrest. Mm. But Prof Professor Tan, if economic concerns are what we're focusing on here as a basis, uh, as, as you put it, a, a very big part of why these protests are occurring, and not just now, but over the past uh, three decades, really, because protests are not un uncommon in Hong Kong. Uh, if that is the basis, then what about these calls for democracy, for universal suffrage? So these politics and economics that are linked together, for young Hong Kongers who are on the street, unconsciously, they feel there's no state. But they thought this is the one country, two system. They thought the, this is democracy. You tell me, 12 years old, they know democracy. When I was 15 years old, I don't understand what's democracy. So mm. I think these two are linked together. Unconsciously, because you don't find a good future, something you can look forward to. So your cost of breaking the system is not high. And therefore you go on, and I think teachers, professors, lecturers in the education institution, they do play a part. They do play a part. You look at the, the YouTube interview, the student, why? Why do you want to go on, on, on a riot? And they say, he asked a fellow classmate, what did the teacher say? He forgot. So this is shocking. Such thing will never happen in Singapore. So, but income disparity before returning to China, 1996 has already crossed 0 0.52. Mm. And if cross 0 0.5, we expect to have street rioting. So this is before returning to Hong Kong. So the British left behind a legacy I must say it's terrible. It's such an unequal. And so this is a showcase for free market economy, a capitalist economy, very much like what Karl Marx predicted. The rich become richer, the poor become poorer. Where is the role of the government? Mm. Mm. Lots of lessons to learn. Thank yes. you so much for coming in. Professor Tan Ki Giap, co-director at the Asia Competitiveness Institute, joining us in studio.